Welcome to the Future of Sharing, which is morphing into the series of the Future of Platforms. It's a series that we really explore how do we make the sharing economy originally work for everyone, but also it's increasingly now how do we make the platform economies work for everyone. I'm Pete Leiden, I'm the founder of reInvent, the community company that's driving this conversation. We're doing this in partnership with Airbnb, who is also trying to figure out new ways forward. And today we are essentially ending a two-year run of the conversations in this series, in this podcast, uh, with Anne-Marie Slaughter. And she is the president and CEO of the New America Foundation, uh, or just New America, I guess they call it. Uh, and uh, she's also the author of many books. She's been in and out of government and leadership positions. She's, we're very, very honored to have her here talking with us today as we try to tie up a lot of threads that we've been exploring the last two years. Welcome. Thanks for My coming. My pleasure. And you're coming in from Princeton and you, that, the, 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 your library, your, your, your local, li your, your kind of home library there, which is, which is quite impressive from this, this point of view here. <laughs> <laughs> many books on many subjects. Nothing makes me happier. <laughs> exactly. And that painting really makes it like kind of austere here. So there we go. Um, well, so here's one thing. A lot of people hear New America. And it was interesting when I was just kind of doing some research on this, me and my team, um, the way it was phrased, it's a think and action tank dedicated to renewing America in the digital age. I'm curious just to talk a little bit about that, a think and action tank. What, what do you mean by that, actually? How, how do you think about those two things in this kind of modern world here? Well, to start with, it means we think that we're in the business of solving public problems and that thinking is hugely important. I am come out of the academy, so I'm not about to say that ideas uh, and research don't matter, they matter hugely. But if you're in the business of solving public problems, uh, technology is happening too fast, change is happening too fast to rely on the traditional, do some research, write up a white paper, publish the white paper, hope that somebody in government reads the white paper, uh, then work to get it enacted as a policy or a regulation or a law then implement it, then discover all the things that don't work and start the whole process over. Uh, you need to be doing much more direct work, finding solutions, circulating solutions, and that's the action part for us. Uh, but relevant to your series here, we call it a think or think and action task, comma, or a civic platform. I mm. much prefer the frame of civic platform on which we connect a research institute, a technology lab, a public interest tech lab, uh, a national solutions network, a media forum, uh, an events hub. So uh, I prefer that frame, but because civic platform is a new term, we, we actually put those two adjacent to say, if you prefer think and action tank, you know what that is, fine. Really, this is a new way of solving public problems, and we're building a civic platform on which those different things sit and are connected. I love that idea. No, I hadn't heard that. Has anyone else kind of used that phrase, a civic platform kind of thing? That's your own? I don't think so. I've been pushing. I wrote an article in 2015 with Ben Scott in the Washington Monthly called Reinventing the Think Tank, where mm -hmm. we laid out this theory that the think tank is an early 20th century way of solving public problems. You know, mm -hmm. Brookings is created in 20, uh, in uh, 1916, the Council on Foreign Relations in 1921, Carnegie Endowment in 1910. That was great. I mean, it was better than, than uh, you know, the spoils system and machine politics, but that's a hundred years old and today and a lot of it is coming out of California. We need, we do need thinking and ideas and research, but we need a better way of solving public problems. And I think the civic platform that can connect the right people in the right way at the right time is the best model. Well, interesting. I was uh, so 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 you, you did a quick overview here without going too deep into it. Explain to me the pieces that come together on that platform. So so you kind of. Just walk us through that a little bit without going too much. So you do it. still have, a, you know, a think tank, which is just slang for a policy research institute. Mm -hmm. uh, what's important about that is policy, right? Those are those those are folks who still think that that um, you know ultimately, if we're going to solve public problems, it's got to be through government. It has to be through a policy or a law. If you want to do things at scale, that's still the best way, but it's only a piece. 
Then uh, next to that is a public interest technology laboratory. And that part is critical. So here's where Washington meets California. Mm -hmm. You know, in Washington, you constantly have to remind people if they are not thinking tech, whether it's education, the future of work, the environment, labor, you name, you name it, tech is going to be part of the solution. Tech is also often part of the problem, but in either case, you must have technologists at the policy table. Todd Park does this best when he was the chief technology officer. He was brought in to save healthcare.gov. Yeah. He says he and uh, Mikey uh, Dickerson from Google could save healthcare.gov, but if they'd been at the policy table, there never would have been a healthcare.gov. They would have designed the whole thing separately. But similarly in California, you don't think enough about needing the policy and the politics. So you bring those two together. That, that part's critical. Um, the next piece is a national solutions network. So here again, I don't think there's any important problem in the country that someone somewhere in some city, in some state, in some town has not come up with a good solution to, but, and who's doing that in real time, right? Who's, who's got a new idea about K through 12 education and is implementing it and iterating just like we do with any startup. Our job is to find those solutions, lift them up, circulate them, connect them, connect them to media, connect them to money, connect them to policy. So that's the third piece. Uh, you know, a, a policy research institute, a public interest tech lab, a national solutions network. And then the remaining two pieces are something we all need. One is a public forum. So those are our events. But of course, those events can be all over the country and they can be virtual as well as physical, they can be a combination, but you do need, you need a public forum. You need to, to kind of bring people in to this conversation. And then finally, a media hub, right? The storytelling piece. Uh, and we pride ourselves on, on writing things in, in, in compelling English, books that people want to read, <laughs> videos. I mean, Lord, if I could have a musical, I would, right? <laughs> <laughs> think about the impact that Lin-Manuel Miranda has had on yeah. how we think about, you know, outsiders. So those five pieces all on a platform. And I can imagine other pieces that, that we discover and we say, hey, the value of a platform is you can all be on this platform and we can connect you in, in positive ways. I love it. And actually, I really, really, really love that. It. It resonates with a lot of what we're kind of doing more on the West Coast here, thinking about that. Um, very, very interesting. Now, um, you guys, you are rooted in D.C. and the East Coast, but on the other hand, you were started by folks coming out of the Bay Area and, and kind of tech firms, if I recall, uh, Ted well, Halstead and others. And I'm curious, kind of, uh, yeah, talk a little bit about the roots, just for those that don't really understand that there, the roots actually are coming from west to east and then now east to west, right? Well, sort of both. We okay. were founded in, in 1999, and next year will be our 20th anniversary. And our four founders were actually all based in D.C. Uh, and they were uh, Mike Lynn, Ted Halstead, Walter Russell Mead, Charles Schweininger. They're based in D.C. and they think we need a new kind of think tank. So from the beginning, we've been kind of uh, trying to, to push the envelope. They then did go to Silicon Valley and the original funding came from California. And they opened a California office very quickly. So you're, you're right that from the beginning, we had both. And Mike Lind, who is just a, a, an unconventional thinker, an intellectual and economic historian, had written a book called The Next America, where he, he, he foresaw the, that the digital revolution, this is back in the mid 90s, would be the equivalent of the steam engine and, and uh, railroads and cars sort of all <laughs> rolled into one. Mm -hmm. So from the beginning, we had also a tech orientation. Uh, we had then we then had to close down the California office. When I came on board, I reopened a California hub, uh, New America, California, that's based in the Bay Area, but we've got folks certainly in Southern California and critically in the Central Valley. We think it's you know, you've got two states in California, the richest and the poorest, and mm -hmm. the poorest is there in, in, in Fresno and the Central Valley, we're working there. We're also in Chicago, Phoenix, Indianapolis, New York, uh, and a partnership with Florida International University in Miami. And when you say a hub, what do you mean by that out here? Because so, so, I do remember the original version, but is it kind of offices, fellows, or, or just say more about your presence out here? 
now we have just a couple of people in the Bay Area who are uh, connecting and surfacing. So when I say a hub, I really mean it. A hub is something that is the, the center of a network. And that means the work is connecting and, and bringing people together and lifting things up. Okay, now, the set, love this and very helpful and it's, it's playing right into what we're gonna be talking about the rest of the conversation here. But the second piece is you see, de- at least the phrasing I've been seeing in here is dedicated to renewing America in the, in the digital age. I'm interested in this renewing America sense. I mean, do you perceive kind of in the broader context of the country and the American history here, do you see this as a very unusual time or a time of, um, that we've seen maybe a handful of times in American history. I'm just curious to, to what extent you see the kind of times we're living in here and b- through that the role of a century of civic platform like this. Is, are we in normal times, in usual times, a rare kind of transition time? I'm just curious how you think of the historical context that you're acting in right now. So I do think we're in a period of renewal, even though uh, you might say, what are you talking about? You know, every headline is worse than the last. We're going down, down, down. I actually think that this is a period, uh, as we have gone through before, often driven by technology, uh, but uh, a period where we are reinventing ourselves. Uh, and, you know, we did so in the middle of the 19th century. We did so in the, in the 20th century from, from really the progressive era, era to the New Deal to the 60s. And conservatives would say to Reagan, but, but um, it, you do not see this renewal if you look at Washington. You do see it if you look bottom up. Uh, uh, Jim and Deborah Fallows have just written this wonderful book about Uh, a, it's called Our Towns, A 100,000 Mile Journey into the Heart of America, where they spent five years flying around the country to over uh, 35, you know, large towns, small cities. Uh, They saw what I've seen crisscrossing the country, giving speeches, that once you get off, uh, out of national politics, and to a large extent off the coast, you need to, this is really the heartland, where people are tired of waiting for solutions uh, and they're, t- they're sick to death of national politics. And, but what's happening is they are coming together and figuring out how to completely remake their schools, how to remake their economies. The best example is the renewal of downtowns. That's why I call it renewal, because you don't discard the old. You, you renovate it. You get rid of a lot of really terrible mm-hmm. stuff. You think about renovating a house. You get rid of the, you know, that kitchen mm-hmm. that somebody thought was beautiful in the 50s or the mm-hmm. 70s. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but no. you keep those old bones if you've got them. And you keep the beautiful view. And you, you take the old and you remake it and you renew it. Uh, and the same is true with our political system. We have routinely, we have these great ideals as a nation. We fall woefully short. And then politicians, leaders, others come come along and they say, everybody from you know Abraham Lincoln to Martin Luther King to say, hey, wait a minute, you said you promised this, you said equality for all, but look at the reality, it's time to renew, like, like renewing your vows uh, as a couple. So I do see that happening. It's probably decades long, but it's coming from the bottom up and the heartland out. You really, so, so, so the, the heartland out. To, to what extent, um, I hear what you're saying there, and I love Fallows and stuff. In fact, Lenny just led a conversation out here uh, with Deb and, 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 and Jim Fallows that I actually was able to attend to down in Silicon Valley, actually, just shortly. Lenny Mendoza. Um, the, uh, but I hear what you're saying, but on the other hand, um, is there a, I, I get when you say the coast, but I'm curious your own understanding of, to what extent something's going on that's different on the West Coast right now than, than the East Coast even, uh, and different than the heartland. So we're watching, for example, you know, the most valuable companies in the world now have kind of grown up on the West Coast here in Silicon Valley and, and, and Seattle. We're watching, you know, a, a different kind of politics, a, a very deep blue, but from states that used to be purple to red even, shifting into really a very different progressive thing. There's a lot of really interesting politics emerging here. There's a lot of new thinking out here. Do you have any kind of way of thinking about the West Coast as distinct from those other two regions you're describing? Well, so the West Coast is the, 
uh, it's the vanguard of of expanding what is possible for everyone, right? It's the extreme. It's the place that is challenging death, is challenging the idea that we're going to be on Earth. We're going to actually go to other planets, you know, is imagining a universal basic income is is and that's you know california's always done that now it's california all the way up to seattle because it draws the most the biggest boldest um kind of adventurers it is that frontier uh and and now you know they can't go any further into the pacific ocean so <laughs> they're going into biology and physics and that's great. You need somebody, you know, who is expanding the envelope. But I would point out that's the coast of California, right? You look at your Central Valley and you're yeah. worse off than many parts of the century. So the idea that it's California, no, yeah. Yeah. it's and similarly with New York, right? New York City plays that role on the East Coast. But take a look at the rest of New York. It yeah. doesn't look like that. Yeah. And what's happening in the heartland is much more relevant to the Central Valley or upstate New York than what's happening on the coast of California. Uh, and again, you can do the thing right up the coast, right up to Seattle versus, versus other parts of Washington or, or Oregon. Uh, and it's a, it's, a, it's a less dramatic kind of innovation but I would argue it is a more relevant innovation for the country as a whole. It is, if you think about it in global terms, we talk about India and frugal innovation. Mm -hmm. It's that kind of innovation rather than the innovation that can be spurred when you have all the money in the world. Mm -hmm. The other thing I will point out though is demographics and the cost of real estate, right? So California has been fueled by, you know, it, as one big, founder in California put it to me, he said, California startups, Silicon Valley startups are, are created by coastal entrepreneurs and Midwestern engineers. And a True. huge number of those engineers did come out of Michigan, Purdue, University of Illinois, those big Midwestern uh, universities. Those people are now getting to the age where they're having kids, millennials are having kids. Their parents, who are my age and older, are, are aging. We're baby boomers. And nobody can afford to buy a house and send kids to school unless you're the wealthiest of the wealthy. So I think you're going to see a big demographic shift back. You can see the hmm. leading edge of it now. Hmm. Where people go back to Columbus, Ohio, or Indianapolis, uh, or Chicago, or, but lots of smaller communities, Ann Arbor, and say, hey, I can afford to buy a house. There's a great university here. I went there. My parents are nearby. They'll take care of my kids and I can take care of them. This is altogether a better lifestyle than Silicon Valley or mm -hmm. New York. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, you're seeing the leading edge, but demographics are a powerful force and the boomers are aging and the millennials are having kids. Very interesting. Yeah. I'm originally, I grew up in Minneapolis, so I, I kind of get the heart and I also, <laughs> but I've been out here for 25 years. But who knows? When you could still afford to buy a house. Yeah, exactly. Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, so we've been talking about the rise of the kind of West Coast here, the, the kind of powerful tech companies, companies that literally 20 years ago were just starting out as a little banging around to figure the, these things out. And yet, or Apple back in the 90s on its back, barely hanging on there. Uh, and now they're the kind of commanding heights of the global economy. Um, these are platforms. And so what I want to just talk to you from your perspective, because you have a unique vantage point, I think, sitting uh, from your perspective. When you talk about platforms, let's talk about the positive side of platforms. So the rise of these things, because you did your future work project, among others, you call your own thing a civic platform. Talk about when you think of platforms, the positive side, and then we'll, we'll get into the negative and we'll talk a little bit about what can be done here. But I'm just curious to really understand um, before we kind of um, get too far down this conversation uh, in a backlash kind of way, what, what, what do you see as the positive sides of these, of the, the growth of these platforms? So I think for the people who have the ability to get onto the platforms. And we'll come back to that because that's critical for the people who have kind of the initial stake <laughs> necessary to get onto the platform to climb up. They are wonderfully decentralizing and democratizing. 
they they allow us to disintermediate, right? Or the platform becomes the intermediary where before we had to go through an institution. So if we just use my own uh, native or my own original job as a professor, I started as a law professor for 12 years and then eight years as a professor of international relations. Professors have required universities, not anymore. I mean, yes, I still believe in universities for all sorts of reasons, but if I now want to teach with the ability, with platforms, I can teach all over the world without leaving, or I can hopscotch from one university to the other uh, and have courses and a brand and expertise on a platform. So it, it, it takes, you know, you used to have these gatekeepers, right? These big universities. And without that, you were, you were stuck increasingly higher education, really lots of education means anyone who can, who has the skills, who has the ability, whose content is attractive will be able to participate. And that phenomenon of decentralizing and democratizing and globalizing, but in a positive way, uh, because people people can do it from wherever they are uh, is is very exciting and it unlocks so much talent and potential when I think about the people who didn't get tenure in the various faculty committees I was on you know they they increasingly can say hey you know um, I can bypass you or more likely I'll start in a university but then I'll branch out on my own mm-hmm so 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 the so you see many positive sides to this obviously, um, and the story largely has been a positive one though, that people have been talking about. But then recently, we're watching the last several years, a couple of years really. It's been quite quick, the kind of backlash and the worry and the concern about many of these platforms and. Um, Tell me about your own thinking about this. How concerned are you about the concentration of power in these things or the, you know, all the issues that are, are arising? I'm just curious. When you look at, you know, some positive things about it, obviously, and we could go deeper into that, but what, what's starting to concern you, maybe, or has been concerning you about, about these things? So I, I, would, I would break that into two broad buckets. Um, one the the kind of size of some of the platforms and two remember where i started if you have the ability to get onto the platform it's great but as as you yourselves are asking how what do we do for the people who can't get onto those platforms and who are left even further behind not only from the economy from society as a whole because society is happening on the platform but let me start with the first i think it's important to distinguish between a platform, which is something that anyone can get access to, and once you're on it, you can get access to others, and the networks that sit on those platforms. Uh, and this is, so if you think about Facebook, that's a social network sitting on the Facebook technology, the Facebook platform. Now, networks, right, grow through network effects. <laughs> it's part of, you know, your attractiveness, if you're in a network, it depends on how many other people are in the network. And this is an issue. This is a huge issue, right? This is where you get, uh, you know, these enormously powerful uh, platforms. It's where they are building a network where the more people join, the more people want to join. Again, this is the old phone company. This is the old railroad. We're not <laughs> networks are are, uh, we're, are not new, but digital networks grow so fast. And that is an issue. I mean, it does trouble me, for instance, that the goal in, of so many Silicon Valley startups is to now to get bought because they don't think they can compete. And every time they get bought, the, the, you know, the acquirer is making that network harder to fight. So we have to think about how do you, how do you have anti-monopoly in a set of businesses that do depend on network effects. Now we've done this before. AT and T depended on network effects, effects, but we still managed to break it up. My own view is I would rather see an emphasis on 
uh, interoperability. I think that's very important because a lot of this, you know, small places, if you could automatically essentially connect to Facebook or some other platform without having to, to be part of it, that would make a big difference. Um, the, the other is just thinking about how to even the terms of competition. Uh, and a lot of people are talking about this by essentially getting these platforms to pay people for the data that they harvest that is their business model. Mm -hmm. right? So then suddenly you'd have much more competition if you didn't have this massive company that gave you everything for free versus a tiny company that can't get going. If you said, well, wait a minute, you know, actually the people who are getting it free become the, become actually assets that you need to pay for them for them they're, they're ways of changing the rules that mm -hmm. i think can change competition but mm -hmm. i do think um it's a it's a big issue we 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 need to enable many more platforms plat and again maybe through interoperability maybe through different kinds of competition but you don't want a world in which there are five or six platforms and nobody else has a chance except to get bought point one um the second point though this issue of how do we make the platform economy truly inclusive is critical. And to me, you have to start with universal, high quality, fast broadband, right? This is, this is the electricity of our era, right? What we had the, you know, the, the Tennessee Valley Authority, we had rural electrification because if you were an electric, you were not in the economy. Well, it's time to take on you know, all the vested interests and say, this is the equivalent to providing roads and telephone poles and water pipes. And I don't know whether we make, make you know, ISP provision a utility, I don't know if government provides it, but I, without that, we are leaving people further and further behind. It's literally as if we're taking parts of our country and putting them at the level of, you know, developing countries that are, if we're in the top 20 countries in the world, they're in the bottom 40 countries in the world. We can't do that. And we will have, you know, upheaval, revolution, deservedly, because you've got, it is, a, it is like the, the people who have access who can play in this economy are living in a gated community, and there's a growing number of folks outside those walls. Yeah, it's a, just a little anecdote. It's this weekend, the holiday weekend, uh, my wife and I and our family went to just about two hours outside of the Bay Area here and uh, to a little town. But you couldn't get cell phone, you couldn't get Wi-Fi, not, not, the, the little homes and cabins didn't have any kind of way to connect to the internet. I mean, this is like two hours out of the Bay Area, too. So it's, it's not like you, you got to go to the middle of the, no. the, the country even, too. But yeah, no, it is clearly a, a big problem. Um, so, so those are two classic ways. So, so I guess the first size thing is figuring out a dig. I mean, you know, like you say, your, your idea is renewing America in the digital age. So there's a there's essentially a fundamental rethink of the digital age equivalent of these issues, really. Exactly. And, and really, in some level, it's almost the the whole era is like that. It's like, OK, how what is a monopoly in a digital age? OK, what is, a, you know, because um, you're right, AT&T had one version, but, you know, um, you know, that this modern digital age is, is a different thing. I mean, just one of the things that's just so extraordinary, one of the reasons these companies are so valuable is they're global, instantaneously <laughs> global. And, and so once you kind of establish that network effect in the United States, you know, boom. In fact, if you look at the unique, I, we're constantly playing with different numbers on this thing. And, and uh, you know, you can take every single human in the United States is 325 million or something. But the unique monthly users of Facebook, Google or YouTube are, you know, billion, you know what I mean? <laughs> so it's like the bulk of their business, but also the bulk of their wealth and their power is coming from outside the country, which is another really different uh, public policy problem here, in a way, um, with the tools here. I mean, now, now the, the, the last couple of years, there's been, so there's been this sense of backlash as, um, there, there, there's been this recognition, essentially, out of no, oh my God, these things are huge, and oh my God, how do they, how, how do we compete with them? Um, but I would say, again, we're coming from it from the kind of the internal side of things here. Um, there is a sense from even inside the industry that they, they don't want to be in this position. I mean, that that they actually, it's almost more of a conversation around unintended consequences. In fact, we had a great. 
um, event just last week um, with Julie Hanna. I don't know if you know Julie Hanna, who's no. the executive chair of Kiva. She's, she was uh, the founder of what's now WebMD. She's uh, now doing a lot of work for Google X. Um, and she's been around for 20 years, had five venture-backed companies. Um, but she was t describing it as a, more of an unintended consequence situation, yeah. and that a yeah. lot of the people in the industry actually want to figure this out differently. I'm just curious, in your own perspective on that, you know, the other side of the coast here, is that your feeling like this is a like that there's a lot of goodwill there to be leveraged, or do you feel it has to be really hammered from the outside, or a Justice Department breakup or something? Some of these things. I mean, I'm just curious, how do you kind of think about possible ways forward in terms of the kind of ways to work this this thing out here? You know, I think there's a lot of goodwill. I, you know, the idea that that. Facebook or Google or Amazon or Apple, you know, set out to um, kind of capture all the profits to to enable the uh, destabilization of American democracy. Come on, I mean, yeah. you know, and and just two years ago, particularly in the Democratic Party, a lot of these people were heroes. I mean, yeah. the, and and in terms of many of their social values. These are the most progressive companies of big business there are, right? When it comes to, you know, GLBTQ rights, when it comes to, to, to inclusion, believing in a lot of values that many of us hold dear. Uh, these are good people who thought they were going to work for good companies. Part of it is they are public companies and public companies, you know, they, they now have to answer to stockholders. And we have a model that of a business model in this country uh, that is short term gains. And they've got a business model that where that's a real problem because they make their money from the advertisers, not from the users. And there's a tension there that means if they are, uh, figuring out how to help the advertisers, just to take Facebook or, for example, or Google, they are allow they're they're creating technology that allows you to pinpoint exactly whom you want to sell to. Well, <laughs> that means if you're the Russian government or if you're a hate group, you can figure out exactly whom you want to sell to. So there are problems in the business model that are creating incentives that mean they don't intend bad consequences, but there really are bad consequences. And similarly, you know, the market wants growth. How do you grow? You swallow up competitors. You know, businesses have been doing that forever. That is where, in my view, there is a real role for government. Uh, there is a role, but but to think that what we've got, what we should just take the 19, the 1880s and the 1916 playbook and apply it wholesale to, you know, the our era is not right either. We have to work with these companies and against them, right? There's some places where you're just gonna have to say, nope, you've gotta accept this kind of regulation. But there are other places where we need to sit down with them and think, how do we get to a better outcome? Figuring out the, the differences uh, of the, the, the economy, of network effects, of wanting inclusion, of, of yes, being global, uh, but in a way that really does still, there's still American companies that serves the interests of the American people. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, so if you, given the, the kind of dysfunction of our national government right now, um, I mean, given the good, you know, potentially goodwill here, I mean, what would you recommend? I mean, if, if you had to kind of figure a way forward here that would move the ball here in a constructive way. Um, do you have any thoughts? I mean, is it, could it be play possibly a player like, uh, you know, a big state like California maybe to set some early terms or something? Or do you see a national, does it need to be national? Is it, could it be regional? Could, could it be self-imposed kind of rethink of how to do these things? Um, could, do we have to wait for the European Union maybe to kind of bash it from outside? Well. I mean, I'm just curious. <laughs> I don't know. What, when you think about it, how do you think about it? If you think of more positive ways forward, how, how, or maybe all of the above, I'm just curious your own thinking around how are we well, going to get out of this I'm situation? I'm thrilled. Um, I, I am so glad that we have the European Union and we have effectively a bigger economy than ours. Right? Everybody talks about the United States and China as the biggest economies in the world. The, United, the European Union 
is the largest economy in the world. That's what the CIA fact book says. So we can take it from there, right? And they are using that economic power based on a very different history than ours, based on a history of surveillance, based on a history of, of war and fascism, uh, national socialism, other things that, that mean they have different perspectives, but those perspectives are actually important so that you have, you know, you have a real kind of uh, m clashing of different ideas, which are important in trying to, to figure out uh, the way forward. But my advice, again, California is the eighth largest economy in the world or the sixth largest, I think actually the sixth largest. Actually, someone so, just referred to it as the fifth. Yeah, anyhow, it's, it's whatever. always battling. So yeah. I mean, it's an enormous country. If California were a separate country, it would be sitting in the G8, mm -hmm. probably, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. From, the, from economic size and a large population. So what I would do if I were California is figure out how to solve California's problems. If the tech companies could actually, you know, work to figure out how the place you just were that had no internet service could get internet service, if they could figure out how to share their wealth with other parts of California, that becomes a model for the country. Silicon Valley and, and, and Los Angeles and uh, the Bay Area, not. Those are not a model for the rest of the country. I mean, in some ways, but but again, the the rest of the country looks much more like the Central Valley or the parts that are just you know are middle class, not the stratospheric mm -hmm. upper class. So in that sense, California is a petri dish for the rest of the nation and a hugely important one. But only as long as it's all of California. The other thing I will say is California looks like the country will look by 2050. Right, you're almost you're already there in terms of the population of what we're going to look like we're going to be majority minority or or really simply plurality because you know there'll be plenty of important white people will still have a tremendous amount of power but the latina latinx population will be critical african americans asian americans of all kinds so there again i look at california and i say that's what my country looks like in 20 years, 30 years, how do we integrate? How do we include? And back to your point, how do we do all this with the economy of the future? Because California's economy is much more the economy of the future than the rest of the country. I could not agree more. <laughs> Basically, I've been playing, playing on this idea for a long time. In fact, Lenny and I have been talking a lot about this. Um, I've built a whole series in um, Medium, frankly, called California's the Future on the future oh, of American uh, of, of California American politics. I'll, I'll send you the link. So it's gotten a lot of attention actually. Um, but I but I, but let's aside from that right now. I love what you're kind of saying there because it, it feels to me like there's. I mean, when you really the rubber hits the road, something. It, it, it's almost like we're in this era. I mean, Lenny makes a big analogy down to. Um, it's more like the progressive era. It's kind of the late 19th century that we're in such a structural thing. We have to really, re I, I agree that there's something fundamental on that kind of level going, but I think it's even more uh, interesting or more challenging, you could say, uh, because we're essentially working in a global context uh, w with a kind of a global challenge like climate change. Um, and we're hitting a series of technologies that are almost like civilization challenging kind of technologies. I mean, artificial intelligence, you know, biotechnology, genetics, um, you know, there's, these things are not just another way to build cars or something, you know? It, 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 so it feels to me like there's some really extraordinary moment we're in here and it doesn't feel like, um, like, wh where are you going to figure that out? Or how are we going to figure that out? And, and, and I think you're, you're kind of parsing it out a little bit, saying there's got to be some kind of experimental space, or there's got to be some kind of way to try this stuff out in at least a large enough scale to allow people to see themselves in it somehow in these other cultures or other parts of the country. Um, but I mean, I, I mean, is that? I, mean, I don't want to put words in your mouth. But are you are you seeing kind of the same kind of context that there's something really um, extremely unusual in the time <laughs> the time we're in here, given some of the challenges? 
Uh, I know you did this work commission on with the coming of AI. You, we're watching it again. I haven't even touched on this biofusion, all the different things going on there. But it feels to me like we're at an era here where we have to do some pretty radical experimentation and do some pretty fundamental reworking of the system that we're not, haven't been able to do for the last 20, 30 years. It, it, but is, it, do you share that feeling? Or do you feel like we actually need to really fundamentally rethink on a, on a much more kind of, oh, what's the word? It's almost literally get down to the basics. I mean, you mentioned how capitalism is working, maximizing shareholder value. I mean, is, if we got to rework that level of a thing, or do we have to really, you know, I'm just trying to get at what, how do we get to these really core fundamental issues here in any yeah. kind of yeah. practical way? Any thoughts on I, that? You know, I do think we're, we are in a decades long period of fundamental change, remaking of how we earn a living or how we provide for our families. And some of that won't be earning at all. It may be, it, it, it may be that things are so much cheaper. It may be basic provisions. It, uh, but at any rate, how we, how we provide for our families, let's put it that way, uh, how we care for our families, equally fundamental, um, where we live, where we work, how we work, I mean, it, it, the change is as great as from the agricultural era to the industrial era. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. the agricultural era to the industrial era took place over a century and a half. Uh, and, you know, and part of the California is, is already there in parts, but it's not even begun to be there in other mm -hmm. parts. So we have to remember that this is a very differential revolution. And it takes a long time and it takes a lot of experimentation in a lot of different places. But I do think that that is what's up for grabs, the future of capitalism. And remember, you know, back in the 19th century, when the future of capitalism was up for grabs, we got communism. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and from there, we, you know, really, Karl Marx is an answer to Charles Dickens, right? The worst mm -hmm. of the industrial mm -hmm. age. And that's 1860s, 1870s, and the Russian Revolution doesn't happen until 1917. And we don't see that play out until, you know, through... The revolution, World War One, World War Two. So there's a lot of time here. Even though things are speeding up, in California, when you're when you're in the Bay Area, you think it's all happening in the next decade. But as you said, you can go to other parts of California where you're you're three or four or five decades back. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we need to we need to take a deep breath and see that there's a lot of experimentation. Um, we should embrace it. We should be thinking big. Right. We, this is no time. This is, again, why I'm, I'm trying to reinvent what a think tank is to surface exi existing solutions, because this is no time for tinkering with existing pol policies. And our politics are telling us that people are saying, I want answers. Well, Trump has answers looking backwards. Mm -hmm. Right. He's like, we just go back and it'll all be fine. Mm -hmm. We know that's not true. But where are our answers looking forward and where are our answers for everyone? Not the great, I won't die, you know, I'll live in this completely technological world with genetic this and whatever. But for everyone, how can we say to people, here are how your children will have a good life. It may not be better than yours. That may not, be may not be relevant. But here are how you and your children will have a good life, will have productive lives, will be able to learn and earn in a world that we can protect, uh, we need different models of what growth is. You know, I, I looked at Japan and I think there's a huge amount of innovation there around the idea that growth is not the engine of the economy, right? Mm -hmm. The circular mm -hmm. economy is mm -hmm. the engine of the economy. And mm -hmm. what does it look like mm -hmm. in a world that has fewer people, and at least in many countries, a tremendous respect for the environment uh, and an ability to, to recycle? So it is a time for big ideas, but also a lot of practical experimentation. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's marrying those two. And again, California is a great place to do that because you got lots of big ideas, but you've also got places where those things need to be tried out and worked out and all the unintended consequences of all of our various schemes and ideas, you know, meet, meet the details. Do, do you, I mean, I don't know how closely you follow California politics, but are you encouraged by the next generation of politicians now that are, are kind of running for governor and, you know, I am. Yeah. you yeah. are. You no, are. no, I am. I mean, you, 
Um, yes, and I'm deeply encouraged by open primaries and things that are fundamentally changing our political system. I mean, if I could do one thing across the country to transform our political system, it would be ranked choice voting across the board because it would force, uh, it, it would, you know, somebody like me it could look at a system like that and say, I could run in that because I can appeal to enough people to be everybody's second choice. But I'm not about to run in a system where I have to be some group of extremists first choice uh, on either side. Uh, so California is not there yet, but the open primary is important. The redistricting commission is important. Um, I know that as a Democrat, people are worrying about the open primary, but we need those fundamental reforms. Uh, and, and I'm excited to see what that opens up for who can run and how can they run. Um, I, I'm, I'm hoping that many California cities will adopt ranked choice voting and then California can too. It could also lead, help lead the movement for, you know, matching electoral votes with the popular, the share of the popular vote so that every state says, whatever the popular vote is, that's how I'll divide my electoral votes, which would get us out of the electoral college system without a constitutional amendment. Hmm, fascinating. The, just one thing, because you know, a lot of cities do do these ranked choice voting. Um, uh, I mean, Berkeley, they do it there. San yep. Francisco does it, Oakland does it. But I haven't really heard anyone talk about it for the whole system. G give me one more beat on why that's an important thing. You're saying because it would bring a different class of kind of political leadership forward? Is that, is that yeah. what you You know, Maine is the first state who voted for it statewide. Uh, and the, the, you know, Maine Supreme Court stuck, the legislature tried to overrule it. The Maine Supreme Court <laughs> struck it down. The people have come back. And the reason's simple, because it, it means that right now we have a, you know, first past the post system. And that, and in a system as polarized as ours is, you have to play to your base. The ranked choice voting means, okay, nobody gets a majority first round. Second round, though, though the, the person who got the least votes, that's canceled out, and those votes then go to one of the players still in. So as I said, if you're me, and maybe you appeal to some Dems and maybe to some Republicans and to a lot of people in the center, I probably am not going to be anybody's first choice, but I might be everybody's second choice. And when you think about that across the political system, don't we want people who are actually people's second choice? Because they're the people who are going to compromise and get things done, rather than the people who, you know, have a, a an extreme view and appeal to some <laughs> absolutely, you know, exercised group of people, um, but are, don't actually represent the majority of citizens. That's how I feel in the country right now, that, that in either case, it's like these people don't represent me. I may be in a party system and I have to vote for a particular you know, side and, and I'm a Democrat and, I'll, and I support a lot of what Democrats support, but I think the base is dangerous in both sides. <laughs> Fascinating. Well, I'd vote for you. Let's put it that way. <laughs> Why don't you run? Um, and when we have a ranked choice system across the country, I'll be happy to <laughs> <laughs> And public financing of elections, because who in their right mind is going to spend all their time not running, but asking for money from rich people. Yeah. So we're, we're getting towards the end here. So, but, um, but you're talking very optimistically at some level about what's possible, how we could move forward. You're, you're, you're coming from a you know, new America, an idea space. You've got a million ideas. How do you square that with kind of the sense of what's going on in the country right now? I mean, do, do you, do you, with Trump and, 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 and this kind of extremely polarized politics, do you see it as a temporary like backlash situation that we're in that we're going to move through? Are you, are you really worried at some fundamental level that we're hitting some impasse that could get a lot worse? And also, given that you've got an international perspective, given your background, um, you know, we're watching the same phenom now all across the world, really, Europe, you know, the back, that similar backlash. I mean, that there's essentially something going on around the planet right now that's a reaction going back, wanting to go backwards in face of a crew that's trying to pull us forwards. I don't know what what what's your what's your um, are, are you basically optimistic of how we're going to get through this or are you, are you really concerned about that backlash? I'm deeply concerned and optimistic. 
I mean, you'd be crazy not to be concerned. It, yes, if you're a foreign policy person as I am, if you're a student of history, as I said, saying that we are in the equivalent of the move from the agricultural to the industrial age should not make everybody jump up and down for joy. That was a lot, that was war and revolution, right? Until we got to basically, if you think from 1870 to 1945, that is that is one of the worst periods of human history in terms of, of death, destruction, et cetera. So yes, I am definitely worried. Uh, because change creates counter reaction and, and people are scared. Um, but I'm optimistic because I think you can, you can't beat something with nothing. That's why, as I said, Trump says go backwards. You can't go backwards. But we don't have a vision going forwards. The communists had a vision. A lot of people bought it. It didn't work. Uh, surely we can do better than that. But I don't think that vision is going to be at the level of people like me sitting in, in beautiful university towns writing books. I think it is got to come from this is actually working in Sioux Falls. This is actually working in Louisville. This is actually working in St. Louis or Indianapolis or Phoenix or Denver or many smaller cities. And I can take you to any one of those. I can show you a thriving food scene. I can show you a tech startup scene that doesn't look as vibrant as Silicon Valley, but is real. I can show you people trying to figure out an inclusive economy uh, and doing an and education that works for everyone. I can show you a city that's renewing its downtown. Uh, and I often think if you could just turn off the national news on the right and the left, just turn it all off and ask people to go and see what's happening in their backyards, they'd see a very different country. Hmm. Interesting. Would you, pulling the lens even further, and again, I know you've been focused on America recently, but um, are you hopeful about what you're seeing around in the rest of the parts of the world too, in terms of, in terms of trying to adapt to this new world? You know, again, there we are. We are in a transitional period between the international order of 1945, that was, you know, the order of the victors, the United States and its NATO allies, and and was better. It was certainly better what came came before. But you have billions of people in the world, multiple billions, who are saying we are not included. We want to be part of it. That's led to paralysis, so you can't get you can't get things done at the global level uh, in the same way you used to be able to, and lots of countries that are having you know with very very nasty politics. So um, we're in for a very very bumpy ride, uh, and uh, I see pockets of real optimism, but I also see countries where I think. Uh, a lot of conflict is likely to happen before we get uh, to, to a better place. I do think that if you put the EU together with the United States, if you put, if you put many liberal democracies together, not just the old West, but many in, uh, in Africa, uh, in South Africa is a good example, um, but so too are Ghana, uh, Rwanda, parts of Kenya, they're, they're placed the countries that really are, are doing important work uh, in every continent. I think I, you know, if I could sort of be in the center of the world and put together the coalitions, there are the materials for it. But I honestly think right now the most important thing to do is to renew our own country. That's why I'm running New America. I mean, I'm a lifelong foreign policy person, but at some point I felt like the United States was hypocrite in chief, right? We're out there preaching values we are not following. Hmm. Uh, and our democracy is broken. Our racial relations are terrible. We, it's time for us to renew our own country. I don't mean pull back from the world, but engage the world in different ways uh, and really work hard uh, on our own country, including, of course, as an immigrant country, as a country that reflects the world. Uh, and I would not say let's let's forget the world, but I would say um, the best thing maybe we can do in the world is to figure out the way forward uh, for all Americans, everyone who lives in this country here at home. Hmm. I love that idea. And given, though, 
the, the platform nature of the future, the digitally interconnected, globalized, you know, one world kind of thing that seems probable will continue. I can't imagine that going too far backwards. Um, those kind of innovations could scale quite quickly abroad. Yes. Uh, and uh, in fact, we're watching right now, I mean, um, all these platforms, you know, one of the things that's make, it, it, it's kind of bring it back to the, what we started, it's like, um, yeah, they were innovated here and they kind of took early here, but oh my God, they've just gone and blown open the whole global economy in so many ways. Um, I mean, Airbnb, the one we've been working with for a long time here, you know, they were started with just trying to wrap their heads around, oh my God, we're disrupting the kind of housing market in, you know, Philly or something, you know, thinking about it that way. And now it's like, you know, the United States is literally probably one of their smaller markets right now compared to really uh, Europe is like 50% of their, and they're, they're a totally global company now in the space of seven years, you know. So I do think there's some kind of interesting uh, promise here that if we do get it right and figure out how to distribute wealth differently off those things to kind of deal with privacy in a more holistic way, um, take care of kind of lower workers who are the gig economy workers in different ways. Anyhow, there seems to be a way that if you did it and it would easily export or could actually easily export. I agree. It, it, and it, we it, can it, learn from other countries about totally. how they're doing it just as much. But again, I guess this would be, this is sort of the new America mantra. Technology itself is neither good nor bad, right? Yeah, Whether yeah. it's a stick or a hoe or an, yeah. you know, and Airbnb, for instance, has has certainly made my life easier. It's it's created so many opportunities, but just as it can create a new global residence market for travelers, it can help create a global housing crisis. Right? I mean, those two things you cannot avoid. There is just no oh here it's all good because the same things that make it so great can all equally spread the bad, and that's where I think and you know California embraces technology more than any other state in the union probably, but then it also has to start building in this understanding as you think about it, what's the downside, what's the downside. Doesn't mean you shouldn't do it, mm -hmm. absolutely not. Mm -hmm. But let's try to think about the downside on the front end and let's let's be prepared when that happens, uh, when inevitably this wonderful thing we created that did so much good does a lot of, uh, has a lot of unintended consequences. Well, I, th I think that's right. I think that's where we've ended up, which is kind of good. If you had to like, you know, maybe it's overstating, but you know, in some respects, this last couple of years of really forcing a real deep thinking in the tech world, a kind of a taking the shine off this, these kind of, you know, puff piece kind of profiles of all the kind of founders yeah. and stuff is not a bad thing. And I think, I think there's a way that we're now getting real. I think they're starting to face up to it differently. And I think, uh, I just hope we can move through this, and I think I think we will. So, anyhow, that seems like a great place to end what has been a fantastic conversation, not just for our little conversation here for the hour, but also for the series. And uh, in many respects, you're leaving it with a very optimistic, but still um, concerned kind of thoughtfulness about where we're at right now. So, thank you for taking the time to be with us in this. Thank you. I really enjoyed it and I look forward to reconnecting uh, physically.